Now, before we draw the map on Horizon Europe, you have to understand a number of other concepts. And the first thing is bottom up versus top down. Now, this is political language. Bottom up means the scientist is totally free to submit any idea you like. Nobody's telling you what to put in. But you're not free. You can't submit the same idea to Marie Curie and the ERC. The scientific area and the idea can be free, but it still has to fit in uh, to the program. But nobody's indicating whether it's music, whether it's Industry 4.0, whether it's photovoltaics. You're totally free to submit any idea you like. Pillar 2 is called Top Down. Now, Top Down means that there's a program on health. Health is divided into about 50 topics. And one of the topics deals with mental health. Uh, cluster four is dealing with digital. And inside there, there's a topic dealing with industry 4.0. Energy, there's a topic dealing with renewable energies. Now, those topics are there to address specific policies in Europe. So can you see the difference between Pillar 1, 2, and 3. In Pillar 2, you have to read a 400-page document. You look at the table of contents. You identify the topic. But then something else is needed. You need to know what's the background to that topic. Who wrote the topic? Uh, because it, it, it can take up to two years to design these particular work programs. So if you're not aware of the expert groups consulted, the policies behind it, and this is what we mean by proposal intelligence, so in the next course, we have a whole module on this. So when you're approaching the program, you need to say to yourself, is it a bottom-up program or is it a top-down program? The next thing you must consider is, do I need partners? Now, in Horizon Europe, a partner is an organization. It's not a person. So we can see here that ERC, it's mainly single partner projects Whereas all the other programs, with some exceptions, involve a consortium. In Pillar 2, 99% of the proposals uh, involve a consortium. So what do we mean by a consortium? When the proposal is submitted, it's submitted as an electronic document into the funding and tenders portal that I just showed you. Now, if a consortium is made up, say, of 10 organizations, one of the organizations is designated as coordinator. Now, I've coordinated 16 European projects. I was probably coordinator of over 30 proposals. Now, when you're compiling a proposal, the coordinator does anything up to 80% of the work. So when I'm a coordinator, I'm going to make sure I have somebody helping me with the job. I call them a proposal manager. And I'm going to make sure I use all the services that are available in the university, national contact points, which you're going to look at in the next workshop. So the person that puts most work into compiling the proposal is the coordinator. Now, the project could involve a lot of different skills. And the project is normally divided into anything, say, between six and nine work packages. Now, you might be in charge of a particular work package. Now, the workload is much less. Now, there's still a bit of work, but a, a, a work package leader might have to write between five and ten pages of a proposal. And sometimes we need a partner to do a specific task. So, for example, we might need a partner to analyze the data, do a pilot project, test the material. So you could be a partner in a project doing a small job and you could be successful. And as a task leader, we might only want two pages from you. So can you see as a newcomer all the different levels of involvement? Now, it's very unusual for a newcomer to become a coordinator unless they have some excellent support. There are some cases, but normally I recommend to newcomers start off maybe as a task leader, maybe move to become a work package leader. And then after a number of projects, you can think about being coordinator and so on. So that's the terminology and the options. And there's another option. It's called third party. And I'm going to look at that in module six of this particular 
particular course. Now that's a lot of information to try to remember. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to draw a map of Horizon Europe, and I'm going to use this famous table called TRL that was invented by NASA, the American Space Agency, back in 1977. And now there's a, a, another table called Social Readiness Level. So if you look at the handout, um, it's, it's, it's on the slides directly after this, explaining what TRL actually means. Now what TRL means is it's a measure of the unknowns. So, so in other words, if you look at TRL 9, so here's a technology that's fully understood the mouse. So um, it's ready for the market. So in other words, TRL 9, in, in NASA, it was called ready for liftoff. It's ready for the next rocket. Whereas TRL 1 means there's so many unknowns, it's fundamental research. TRL 2 and 3 means we're working on it at laboratory level. And TRL 4 means we have it working in the lab. It's not very pretty, but there's the official photograph of the first mouse. And it just proved that you could move a dot across the screen. And then TRL 5, 6, 7 is about demonstration, prototyping, and so on. And we can see here that universities normally operate in TRL 1 to 5. Now, this is not a scientific table. It's just a rough indicator that NASA developed to see what stage of development the technology was at. A research center is more about, you know, developing prototypes, testing them, whereas companies and society are more interested in technologies that are nearly fully, fully developed. So it's a very, very rough table, uh, but it gives an indication of the different interests of the different types of organizations. So let's see, how does Horizon Europe map onto this? We're going to see where can we get funding where we don't need partners, and where do we need consortia? Now we can see that pillar one is perfect for universities, and we're going to look at ERC, we're going to look at Marie Curie, and we're going to look at research infrastructures. And if you look at the top universities in Europe, in some of them, over 90% of their funding comes from Pillar 1. So universities love uh, Pillar 1 because it's all about making Europe a leader in science. Now, Pillar 2 goes roughly from TRL 3 up to TRL 7. It's top down. And in Europe, there's something called state aid rules. It determines how much funding public bodies can give to companies. So because of that, there are two types of grants. One is 100% funding, which is laboratory type research. And one is 70% funding, which is more about demonstrating prototyping and so on. So when you read pillar two topics, it tells you we're looking at renewable energy and it might say it's an innovation action. So the focus is on demonstration and trials and so on. Pillar three appears to be more relevant to entrepreneurship, which is true in the case of EIC Accelerator. So EIC Accelerator is where a single company can get funding to scale up their technology. The innovation ecosystem is more about funding incubators and support services. And there's something called EIT, which is about developing the entrepreneurial skills of researchers. And we're going to visit all of these in, in this particular course. The biggest surprise in Horizon Europe is something called EIC Pathfinder. It is perfect for universities and research centers. It used to be called FIT in Horizon 2020, but now it's in pillar three. So if you're a university or research center, EIC Pathfinder goes from TRL1 to TRL4. So a lot of universities may not see this. So I'm going to look at that as an opportunity today. And an EIC transition is more, if you have a business idea, how to do some uh, studies on the business potential of the idea. And further out here then, you have all the other programs like InvestEU and structural funds. Now, you might find this surprising, but this diagram does not exist in Brussels. It took us three months to design this diagram. 
But I think it's a far uh, easier way to explain Horizon Europe than just looking at a list of programs. So as I'm going through uh, the different programs, this is the diagram uh, we're going to use to explain what's actually going on. Okay, now, so here you are. You're trying to decide where do I fit in. And you want to prepare a plan. So what we're going to do in this workshop is you're going to prepare a PowerPoint presentation. And you're going to say, I could be an ERC, I could be in a Marie Curie action, I could be in Pillar 2 as a coordinator, work package leader, third party. There's something there called CSA, which I will describe. Uh, there's EIC Pathfinder. I could be in the widening program, or I could start off by being an evaluator. So these are the options. And when you're making your PowerPoint presentation, you can see the vast, the, the, the wide variety of opportunities they are. Now, if you're an early stage researcher, a, a young researcher starting your career, I always recommend people to start being an evaluator, to learn the evaluation process. Cost actions, these form networks of scientists in the same area. And we're going to look at that in the widening program. You could be a third party or a task partner or a CSE. Uh, you could be an MRA Curie, you can get funding for PhDs or funding for postdocs, or you might simply want to visit a, a research uh, infrastructure. So in module seven, we'll come back to this slide and we'll show you a template uh, for, for presenting it. So that's the end of uh, module one. And, and what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the individual programs in uh, pillar pillar 